800 glue and that is God that is love that is unity that is enlightenment we must stick together like glue 754 800 glue call in or text leave your questions and we will answer all your questions during the next broadcast or leave your comments below and we will answer all of your questions during the Q&A of the next broadcast so we love y'all Bless. yo 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 what's going on it's your boy, Brother Ross, one time for your mind, though. And we would like to welcome you all to episode two of Glue the Movement Radio. And before we get into it, before we get into the second episode of our podcast series, I would like to introduce my co host for episode two, another esteemed and honored staff of Glue the Movement Radio. My sister, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners? Hey, what's going on, y'all? My name is Camille. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got Sister Camille with us all the day. Like I said, she's going to be co-hosting with me. So, mm, get ready for this one. I'm excited. Yes, yes. Let's get hype, boy. What we are going to be doing is we, what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be doing a Q&A from episode one. As you know, we premiered Glue the Movement Radio in episode one, and the topic was unifying melanated people. And we had uh, Brother Jovan, and we had Sister Alexis on with us. And um, we, 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 we broadcasted episode one, and we got a lot of feedback off of episode one. So what we did is from all the questions that we got from episode one, we put together Q and A. So what we're going to be doing for episode two is we're going to be answering some of the questions that we got from episode one, and we're going to be answering them live on the air. So Sister Camille, are you ready? Of course, let's get it popping. Awesome, 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 awesome. So, Sister Camille's going to read the questions, and then we are both going to answer the questions accordingly. So, based off episode one, Sister Camille, what are some of the questions that some of the listeners had for us that we're going to answer today? All right, the first question we got here is, explain what you meant by the body parts analogy. Okay, okay, the body part analogy. (laughs) Okay, so from the first podcast, um, we had the analogy of uh, body parts, pretty much. And the reason why I use that analogy is because one thing, whenever we're addressing the black issue, whenever we're talking about, okay, we want to address blacks, we want to talk to blacks, um, we always get a reaction of fear. And the reaction of fear is that, oh, well, how come it's only a black thing? How come you can't address the other races too? And to address that, we did not start this show or we're not doing anything to make black people seem like they're better than any other race. We're not trying to uh, lift black people above any other race. So the reason why I use that analogy is the perfect analogy because we are all mankind. We're all a part of mankind, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're Asian, we're all a part of mankind. So we are like a body. So if you have a body, if any part of that body is missing, that body is considered crippled. Okay, just because you have the whole entire body and the hand is missing, you don't walk around like you're still cool. If you have a whole entire body and a foot is missing, if any part of that body is missing, that body is considered crippled. So now when you look at mankind, when you look at human beings, you see that blacks, for one reason or another, has been completely excluded from the rest of mankind, completely separated and isolated from the rest of mankind. And it seems that mankind has taken the fact that blacks have been taken as commodities and that black people can be used as profit. And now the whole world is seeking to exploit the present day condition of black people, but we are a part of the body too. Without us, mankind is crippled. There is a part that the black man has to play that without it being played, there is no other race that can facilitate that function. So we cannot continue, uh, 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 let's address the whole entire body when the hand is missing. No, let's get that hand back. 
Let's get that foot back. So we don't do what we do on the show to try to exalt blacks above anybody, but we're actually trying to restore blacks back to an equal position in mankind. To where you don't look at whites and look at Asians, but when you look at black, it's a whole entire, completely different connotation from the rest of people. They say that, oh, we're all color and we're all a part of mankind, but until we get that in our minds, until it's not just something you say to sweep the discrimination and prejudice against black people under the rug, until it becomes an actuality, then it's just words. So we need to discuss the things that is keeping blacks from being considered or looked at as an equal part of mankind, as an equal part of the body. Is there anything you would like to add to that, Sister Camille? Nothing big, but just the fact that I feel like now we are where we are because we have the systems and the labels to take away from what the black like who black people are really like who right. we really are you know what I'm saying right. so I feel like once we get past that then we'll just be able to look at each other as human beings like you said like right. we're part of a body right. and we'll be able to move forward because once we all come together black, white, Asian, Spanish blue, green you know what I'm saying right. we're unstoppable Right. That's that's we're just unstoppable right. there's nothing we can't do right and that that's that's the whole you know I, it's not that I disagree with people when they say, oh, well, we shouldn't just address color, you know, we're just all one. But when we speak the word black, black means that we understand that we're all human beings and that we are all spirit beings born inside of earthly vessels. Okay? But spirit beings born inside of earthly vessels that are known as black have been through a particular set of conditions and it is not that we are the only race that has been through these conditions or are going through these conditions but when you think of these specific conditions that we call oppression the first thing you see is the black man so as we have become the the representatives of oppression when we speak black it may not necessarily only be to the black man but it speaks to those who are the representatives of an oppressive system that is actually afflicting the whole entire world so that is what we mean when we speak black we don't mean that blacks are the only people going through these conditions but we do mean that black is indicative to a certain set of conditions that is going on around the world and if we can deal with that condition in the black community now we will have the prototype now we may find the answers to deal with these conditions going on in other parts of the world so first we want to start with our own We don't want to go all over the world and we haven't even dealt with this problem in our own backyard. But we are a part of a body and that is what we are working towards. Stood. So what other questions uh, do we have from our listeners? All right. The next one we got is what do you mean Black Lives Matter needs to just not be focused on white people, but it needs to be focused more on black people? When, When I read this question... You know, from my point of view is Black Lives Matter is for black people. I didn't really think it had anything to do with white people until mm-hmm. later on you actually came to me and was like, yo, Black right. Lives Matter was it was created by black was created by white people. Mm-hmm. Then that kinda yes. yo, that made my mind flip. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. It made my mind flip. Like <laughs> yes. I'll be real. Yes, yes. I'll be real. It had me thinking like what is the real purpose of yes. Black Lives Matter now? You yes. know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. And um, that right there, yes, uh, Brother Jovan brought up this point that um, he was quoting uh, Wesley Mohammed, which was on The Breakfast Club. Um, I think everybody, I think everyone should go to The Breakfast Club and look up that interview that uh, Breakfast Club did with Wesley Mohammed. It is a very powerful interview among the top ones there. Um And he brought up the point that Black Lives Matter should not be so focused on white people or other people, but that it should be uh, more focused on black people. And the reason why 
remember something. This is historical, and you can find this from um you can find this on your hidden colors, or you can just find this by doing your research. Um, one of the ladies, um, her name escapes me right now, but um, I will you know put her name down in the comment section. I will put her name down on the video. Those rules have not worked for us. The white woman's liberation movement, we don't have anything to do with that. We have not been under the control of the black man for over 500 years, so what do we have to get liberated from them from? Hmm. They haven't been our boss. That's the white woman and her man. They're going through that, and that's their business. We don't have any business being in there. They only introduced it to break down the civil rights movement. Civil rights movement started with the black man, the black woman, and the black child standing together, trying to plead for a freedom, justice, and equality, and more benefits in the country that they had had built. They threw the white woman in there with the women's liberation movement and made it a woman against man thing. That created a big separation between black men and black women because then everybody started going for self. That movement was started to wash out the civil rights movement because when the black movement was, and I, I, I give honor to all of my fathers in the movement who has done the research to bring us this information, not presenting any information as if it is our own, but giving credit to where credit is due. When the black movement was in the spotlight, you had Watts riots. When the black movement was in the spotlight, civil rights, you had people flying into America from other countries, white people, Mexican people, Asian people. You had people from all other walks of life flying into the country to get behind the black struggle. So even in the Black Panther era, you saw that Asians were getting behind the, Afri the, the, the African-American, the black struggle with yellow peril. You saw that the poor whites was getting behind the African-American struggle. And if you want to know how powerful the poor whites are, the poor whites alone was enough to get Trump in the office. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. what, yes. brings me, I, what pokes my curiosity, not my, my curiosity, but what makes me remember something is someone said, I, one of our presidents, former presidents, right? He said, in order to keep control, you need to you need to have the poorest white man thinking he is better than like the richest black man mm. so it's like mm. that just shows you how much power they have you know right. what i'm saying right just that one comment was like dang right right, right. and and that was all a part of the separation they don't want any other race or they don't want as we said before they don't want they don't want everyone going through the conditions that the black man goes through to come together. Because if everybody across the whole entire world going through the same conditions as black people came together, we would actually outnumber the oppressor. Yes. So they make sure, especially in America, that they keep the black problem isolated. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So as a part of keeping the black problem isolated, they create these groups that what it does, it dissipates energy. Because when the black man gets angry, when the black man finally wakes up, you wake up the sleeping giant. That is the black man. We make change. We, hmm, we stomp across the land like giants do. And the white man is afraid. He is afraid of another L.A. riot, another yes. Watts riot. He is afraid of it. You see what I'm saying? So what they do to dissipate energy is they create these uh, groups to wash out the black movement, to wash out the black issue. So, as you've seen with Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter started off as fighting for blacks being killed in the streets by police officers. Now, Black Lives Matter is fighting for the LGBTQ agenda. What does one have to do with the other? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, what does one have to do with the other? Now, blacks are in Palestine helping the Muslims fight for land in Israel. 
Now blacks are even taking up causes in the United Kingdom. See, that's the problem. We don't know ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't have our identity. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we're trying to fit into everybody else's group, mm -hmm. but not our own. Right. But at the same time, people on the outside are trying to fit into our groups. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Shoot, it's like the one big old mess. And that's, that is what it comes down to. What it comes down to is lack of identity. Mm -hmm. I pull up this quote from Malcolm X. And this quote from Malcolm X, it says, the Negro revolution is controlled by foxy white liberals, by the government itself. But the black revolution is controlled only by God. Ooh, come on. Come Malcolm on. X. Come on. So what Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter was started by white liberals. But blacks were so excited to have white people get behind their cause mm -hmm. that blacks began clinging mm -hmm. to this support and calling it their own. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? But, uh, as in this crooked game of power politics here in America, the Negro, namely the race problem, integration, civil rights issue, are all nothing but tools used by the whites who call themselves liberals against another group of whites who call themselves conservatives, either to get into power or to retain power. Among whites here in America, the political teams are no longer divided into Democrats and Republicans. The whites who are now struggling for control of the American political throne are divided into liberal and conservative camps. The white liberals from both parties cross party lines to work together toward the same goal. And white conservatives from both parties do likewise. The white liberal differs from the white conservative only in one way. The liberal is more deceitful, more hypocritical than the conservative. Both want power, but the white liberal is the one who has perfected the art of posing as the Negro's friend and benefactor. And by winning the friendship and support of the Negro, the white liberal is able to use the Negro as a pawn or a weapon in this political football game that is constantly raging between the white liberals and the white conservatives. The American Negro is nothing but a political football, and the white liberals control this ball through tricks or tokenism false promises of integration and civil rights. In this game of deceiving and using the American Negro, the white liberals have complete cooperation of the Negro civil rights leader, who sell our people out for a few crumbs of token recognition, token gains, token progress. Blacks are being used as a pawn in a war between white liberals and white conservatives. You see what I'm saying? And this is where Black Lives Matter came from. It was white liberals getting behind the cause of police brutality. Now, while it is great to have their support, understand that when you are sponsored, there's certain issues you can't talk about. When you are, as Malcolm X said, uh, the white liberal movement that backs blacks is controlled by the government. That means if the freedom of blacks must come at the expense of the system, it must come at the expense of the status quo, it must come at the expense of things the way they are today, the white liberal is going to pull you away from that because the white liberal is not interested in destroying the system. The white liberal is not interested in destroying the structures that are in place. The white liberal is interested in taking over the system, taking over the structures that are in place. You see, so do we see Black Lives Matter fighting for black owned schools? Ooh, come on. Do we see Black Lives Matter fighting for economic infrastructures in the black community? Come on. Do we see 
Black Lives Matter fighting for the restoration of the black family? Or do we see them pushing the Eurocentric culture upon our own people? Willie Lynch expressly says that everything that we set in motion for our people will be locked in place by reversing the gender roles of the black man and the black woman. Because Willie Lynch, the enslavement, it is based on keeping the black man away from his true identity. Because black did not start with slavery. But as long as you separate the black man away from who he was before slavery, then slavery is all he will have to revert back to. And by slavery, we don't really mean only getting whipped and right. not getting fed. There's a bunch of difference, like slave and slavery. Right, right. So when it says Willie Lynch, when he says you keep them separated from who they were before they begin to enter these different systems of slavery, it says now the way you keep this hinge, the way you keep this Willie Lynch perpetuating for hundreds and maybe even thousands of years is now you switch the gender. So now for the man to come back to who he was in Africa, he first has to realize that he's a man. For the woman to come back to who she was in Africa, she first has to realize she's a woman. So when you make the man a woman and you make the woman a man, you completely lock them out from ever discovering who they were because now you have them completely out of the position that they must be in to understand who they are. So now you see that Black Lives Matter is pushing agendas that is directly controversial. That is directly, excuse me, contradictory to what it takes to restore the black community. But it has the name Black Lives on it. And the blacks that you see who are getting behind this movement are mostly those who are convinced that whether consciously or subconsciously that we will never be free, but blacks will have a better living conditions under white liberals. Under white conservatives, they have used the Bible to whip us and beat us, but maybe if we help the white liberals get in charge, maybe living conditions will be easier for blacks. But that is not what the black man needs. The black man does not need a new oppressor the black man needs to be free. You see, so what an organization uh, uh, representing blacks need is to focus on internal change. Because I, in every time we say this, supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement rise up and attack, but it is true. We cannot tell the world that black lives matter when we don't live like our own lives matter. You can turn on BET and MTV or you can turn on any radio or, or, or TV station that shows black music videos and see a black man killing another black man in cold blood. And when you say, listen, black people, before we deal with the police killing us, we need to first deal with black people killing ourselves. What is the response we get? Well, white people kill white people too. Asian people kill Asian people too. How come we only talk about blacks are the only blacks that kill each other? First of all, we're not talking about the white man. That is the problem. That's seriously the problem. We're not talking about the Asian man. That is the problem. Just because white kill whites don't mean blacks should be killing blacks. Exactly. Just because any other race is participating in the genocide of their own at any level does not give black people a pass to do it too. When will black people stop following and start being examples to the world? There is a high, high rate of rape and molestation in the black community. And someone will answer and say, well, it's more rape and molestation in the white community than in the black community. Okay, so does that make the rape and molestation in the black community okay? Just because another race is doing it does not mean it is okay for us to do. So we need to focus on changing our mindset and how we look at each other. 
how we treat each other, how we love each other. And maybe if we change the way we look at each other and treat each other, then other races won't feel like they have a pass to mistreat us because other races are treating us how we treat ourselves. So maybe we should set, set the standard for how a black man should treat one another. So this is where Brother Javon was going when he said Black Lives Matter or any organization representing blacks that is truly by the people, for the people, with the people, and not just a representation of the people in the system. This is what he meant when he says it needs to be focused more on black people. We need to focus on changing our own people. The seven things we need to focus on, we need to focus on restoring the black family unit, restoring black economics. We need to work on restoring the black spirituality. We need to work on black education. Stop letting oppressors teach our children. We need to work on black media, uh, black news outlets, which reflect what is really going on on the hood, not what they want us to know. We need to work on black arts and entertainment that reflects the black man, not just in the context that he is stereotyped to be, but in the context of what we actually are. And we as black people need to come together into a collective that will control the politics that affects our communities. If an organization claiming to represent blacks are not dealing with these seven things, these seven mountains that affects every nation, then it is not a true black organization for the people. And it is not even a true black organization from God. So that addresses that question. So that addresses that question. Yo, 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 what's happening? It's your boy, brother, Royce, one time for your mind, though. Yo, the new mixtape, X Out the Mecca, Volume 1, Return of the Red Prince, is available now for streaming and downloading on your computers and your mobile devices at the website glueoutcapulon.com slash music. On Volume 1 of this trilogy series, you're going to get such tracks as... I'ma be the man who stand for the truth <laughs> Went from Cumberland Grand to a burning bush <laughs> That's the plans of I am, if you turn to look You see I am that I am, wanna burn and yuck <laughs> Learn the truth, <laughs> but you trying to burn your roots <laughs> Swerving you, <laughs> busting to the burning mute <laughs> Turn to <and> shoot, <laughs> Cowboys Michael Irvin too When you hit the corner, hit corner, you got another two <laughs> Only you, but they lying and they grabbing They ain't got no one to teach their way out of slavery They ain't got no one to teach the way to the babies Cause babies have them Baby's most subscribe to the same. My hesitation severe, my dedication severe. So I fight out unbelief and depression that eat the years. Insurrection of everything I hold dear. When pleasure threaten to take me directions, I ain't scared. Doubt of self of this a trajectory that you steer. Alive and well is hope and negotiation for all my peers. The Bible tells a noble where ocean flow over peers. And the boat that brought us over named Jesus were first steer. The kill reverence speaking these lessons we must hear. My message is more echo, yes, stressing it will appear. But Jason is that just my confessions and if it's real, but no second guess yourself in that test you will first appear. I know you're scared. Hold my hand, we're going there. No one said it's gonna be easy, it's gonna be hell. They show they care, so no one says for all the years, but they give a for freedom, not fully, they hold it there. So hold it there. Listen, partner, I know you're scared. Oh, what we will do when your nuisance no longer there. My soul today, a prophet and pockets are doing the fair. Well, in the dark, we need to hold us like dragon by solar power. Oh. Okay, we slide till our eyes tie. Our people in the dark, ain't no better time to shine. In the shadow, but I leave it death where we reside. I ain't talking weed when I'm talking to your life. Man, I'm high off the revolution. Ain't getting high as a leak, check we need resolution. And you know I keep it going like a revolution. Keep my music in rotation like a revolution. With the music, watch me turn the valley in the group. But all God, I guarantee we love the loser. But without them, we'll remain in this destitution. In the time, I'm looking for some restitution. But black people gotta take back your God. Take back your economy. Break the facade. Take back the family. Get let or a shot. Don't wait for the cops to kill them. Now we're going to march. Take back your destiny. Never let them rub it. You fight the 
enemy, but they profit off your dependency. Trying to be a man, take your woman hand. Pray for God and make it a father you never had. See Satan, he done hijacked your mind. Cause he can't create, cause that ain't his design. But when we put our faith in his ways, in his eyes, then what we say, we create the place he resides. The Bars, bars, bars. So listen, if you want lyrics, you want flow, you want enlightenment, then get you conscious, get you woke, and get you right again, then head over to the website, grewakebulon.com, and download the new mixtape, X out the record, today. So... My sister, uh, what other questions do we have from um, our listeners to uh, episode one of our podcast? All right, so this one is, I hear you talking about bringing together blacks from all these completely different walks of life. What is the point in bringing all different belief systems together when no one believes the same thing? Mm, Okay, good question, good question. Very, very good question. Um... What, what we were talking about on episode one, me and Sister Alexis and uh, Brother Jovan, was that we need to bring together blacks on the same mindset, on the same page. So what is looking like, this question is coming from the perspective of, in the interview, we was talking about bringing together black Christians, black Muslims, black Buddhists. Blacks from all different walks of life, even bringing blacks out of these white liberal LGBTQ communities and bringing our black homosexuals and our black lesbians back home because that movement is not true representation of blacks. It is blacks, blacks, because we have not had representation in our own community. Now blacks have disseminated into these other movements because it is the only place they feel like they have a voice. But now once we start becoming the voice to ourselves and we start uniting on the fact of being black, when someone looks at you before they notice you're gay, before they notice uh, 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 your sexual orientation, before they notice your religion, before they notice anything about you, the first thing they notice about you is that you are black. Point blank period. Point blank period. Before they notice it, you're black. So let us come together on the basis of being black. And the whole point of us bringing together these different walks of life, like I said, we are a body. We first need to understand the structure of a body in our own community before we can understand it on a mass scale. We first need to understand what it means to be a body, a microcosm, before we can understand it macrocosm. So let us understand what it means to come together with each other so that we can then understand what it means to come together as mankind. You see, so we got to get out of our comfort zones, man. The black Christian is too comfortable being a black Christian. I, I think that's just pride. Not to cut you off, but no, that's pride. No doubt. It's pride. No doubt. I, I know some Christians. You can ask them, hey, what religion you are? I'm Christian. And they just, it's not bad that you're Christian, Mm -hmm. but it's just, come on. Like, you're more than just Christian, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. At the end of the day, you're more than Christian. Exactly. And when people have all these questions, you know, because I believe in Jesus Christ as well, but I don't label myself a Christian because I don't like being put in boxes. Exactly. These labels separate us. These are all labels. You can be a black Muslim and that's the way that you interact with God. You can be a black Buddhist, that's the way that you interact with God. You can be a black Christian, that's the way that you can interact with God. All of these things were started by God, but we labeled it. And with labels, we put definitions on it. And it became traditions and customs. There is something that the black Muslim can teach you about God that no other belief system can teach, reveal. There is something that the black Christian can reveal about God that no other religion can reveal. There is something that the black Buddhists can reveal about God that no other belief system can reveal. But if we never come together, we stay stuck in our boxes. Yeah. 
So if blacks are coming together, like my sister Alexis said, we have to come together on something that draws us outside of our sexual orientation, that drives us that drives us beyond our belief system, that drives us beyond whether you stay in the ghetto, whether you stay in the suburb, whether you stay in the valley, something that brings us out of our comfort zones. It was a saying, it says, comfort is the enemy of growth. Complacency is the enemy of progression. I want y'all to write that down, post it on Facebook, whatever. Comfort is the enemy of growth. Complacency is the enemy of progression. As long as you are in your comfort zone, you will not grow. Bible. Yes. See? So, um, my sister, what is the next? These are awesome questions. Awesome questions, by the way. On our podcast, um, we have our podcast on SoundCloud. We post our pound, uh, um, podcast on our Facebook. We also post them on our Twitter, on our Instagram. Please feel free to comment with your questions. Uh, feel feel. Feel free in any way to get at us and ask questions. These are great questions that we have been asked here. So, my sister, what is the next question? Let's keep it rolling. Let's keep All it right. going. The next one is explain deeper the nature and Willie Lynch subject. Mm-hmm. What does God have to do with us coming together? We can't just hope that things will change or wait on God to do it in blind faith, but it's going to take action. Okay. Awesome. We, this was, um, we covered this during the, uh, we also covered this during the uh, the podcast when we was asking what it what it would take to come together, and when we answered the club um, the question on um, Brother Jovan, he spoke and he said we have come together on many things, but it's always temporal. It always dissipates over time. It always burns out, and we just end up going back to our regular everyday life. So at the end of what will it take for us to come together, we were left with the question, what will it take for us to stay together? And I believe that is where God comes in. Because what is God? What is God is uh, infinite, infinitely renewing power, right? Um, he is eternal. God does not die. You see what I'm saying? So, and we're just going completely on the surface here, not even getting into the deep uh, metaphysics of it, but God is an infinitely renewing power source. Okay? So, if the problem with black unity is that it always dies out, The problem with black unity is that it always dissipates. The problem with black unity is that it doesn't last. Then in order for black unity to last, in order for black unity not to die out, in order for black unity not to dissipate, then we need to connect to that which is eternal. That which never dies. That which is infinitely renewing. The biggest thing that happened when they asked um, asked me to explain the Willie Lynch thing, the biggest thing that happened when we were brought over here and you read these Willie Lynch letters is that the black man was separated from God. And it doesn't say anywhere in the Willie Lynch letter that the black man, we're going to separate the black man from God. No, it compared us to wild horses. And it said in order to break in a wild horse, you have to break that horse from its nature and put that horse into a condition to where it is dependent upon the tamer for survival. Because the horse in its nature has every means of providing for itself. So when you take the horse out of that nature, you now put it in an independent state by which it cannot survive without its master because it has been taken out of the nature by which it has learned how to survive on its own. Now that nature that Willie Lynch is speaking against, that nature is God. If you you read the Bible, the Bible says uh, us in God and God in us. That is two parts. Us in God and God in us. God in us is God in your everyday nature. That's when you separate a man from his nature, when you separate a man from his identity, you are separating a man 
from God in him. Come on, brother. Come on. You're separating him from that. And now you have him in such a state of void, such a state of darkness, such a state of blindness, such a state of ignorance that now it is easy to bring him into subjection. You see, so I understand what you're saying that we can't just hope that things will change, right? And we can't just live in blind faith because that's what religion has taught us. But if you watch the fishing videos and you take the fish out of water, you take the the sword fish or a, a, a nice sized fish that can jump, that can fairly get some distance when it jumps. You take that fish out of water, that fish will keep trying to jump back into the ocean. Even I saw a video, they took a squid out of the ocean and the squid squeezed through this little hole and it squeezed back into the water. When you take something out of the water, it's going to keep trying to jump back in that water. So even when you separate the black man from God, they will keep inevitably trying to go back. They will keep inevitably. It says in the Willie Lynch letter, Willie Lynch is a psychiatrist. And he noted that the mind has a strong drive to recorrect itself over time. That is the black man trying to get back into the ocean. That is the black man trying to get back to his nature. So what do you do if you don't want that fish to get back into the water? You put that fish in a bucket. That's what religion is. Religion sees that without a system in place to maintain the separation between the black man and his God, the black man will instinctively, by his nature, reconnect with the higher power. We are spiritual people by nature. So they have to put religions in place as buckets to keep the fish from hopping back into the ocean. So in these religious institutions, we are taught that just keep the faith. God is coming soon. Just have hope. Things will get better. Don't worry about it. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. But meanwhile, your oppressor has guns and he's killing your people every day in the street. Oh, let's just pray about it. Let's just pray let's about, just it. Pray about it. it. Let's just take it to God. You see? As you saw in the movie Birth of a Nation, Birth of a Nation shows you the beginning of religion. So in the question before, how could we bring together people from different parts of religion? These are things that we will begin to understand when we all come together as one. When we all come together as one and we get out of the boxes that we have been grouped in, in our different religions, the different buckets that the fish have been put in to keep them hopping back into ocean where they swim together, then we will begin to understand who God is truly, not through the eyes of our religion. So when a black Muslim is allowed to walk side by side with the black, with the black Christian, with the black Buddhist, then those three will begin to get a deeper understanding of God than they otherwise would have been trapped in their individual boxes. Because that's when all the pieces come together. Yes, that's when all the pieces of God that these religions originally are begin to come together. You see, so uh, God has everything to do. If God doesn't have anything to do with us coming together, he definitely has something to do with us staying together. You see what I'm saying? It is religion that teaches us how to love each other, that teaches us how to forgive one another, that teaches us how to turn the other cheek when your brother slaps you, to forgive when your brother slaps you. You may have a hard problem, you may have a hard time applying these concepts to the white man, to the oppressor. I ain't turning the other cheek. The white man, the white man been killing us for 450 years and you telling me to turn the other cheek. But let's first apply these concepts to ourselves. 
I can understand how it is hard to apply forgiveness and turning the other cheek and, 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 and all of these concepts to the oppressor. But let's first learn to apply it to ourselves. Maybe that's the way it was meant to be used. For us to learn how to apply it to each other. Religion is basically organizations that dictate morality. And what blacks need is a universal code of morality on how we deal with each other. That is the first step in beginning to unite blacks as a collective unit. My sister, would you like to add anything to that? or? No, brother, you hit the nail on the head with that one. Yes, you, yes. You, you have me learning something new today. Yes, and that's what these questions are for. These Consider our podcast with me and, and Brother Jovan and Sister Alexis and Sister Camille and some of the other staff members that we will have coming on doing these podcasts. Consider these as things to get the conversation started. Exactly. We're not trying to sell you anything. No. We're just trying to throw a little seed in your head. That's you know, it. Saying, do your own research. That's it. Now, as you do your research now, the questions that you have for us now gives us the chance to delve deeper. Mm-hmm. Now it gives us a chance, you know, crack that seed open and let that flower bloom a little bit. So thank you all for your questions, uh, sister. Uh, what is the next question that we have from our, from our readers? All right. Explain more in depth. Are you saying that we don't need to read? The E in your acronym name, GLUE, means alignment. So when you say that we don't need to read books, are you saying we shouldn't educate ourselves? Okay, 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 okay. That's a fair question. It's, it is it's a fair, fair question. Fair. It's a fair question. Um, on the podcast, when we were speaking about the nature thing, when we were speaking about the, when we were speaking about the whole um, nature thing, I said that when you reconnect to your nature, there will come a time where you won't even need books anymore. And what I'm speaking about is I am speaking about the condition in society where you need a book to tell you how to love one another. Now, as Brother Jovan said, uh, when you have been raised in a society like that, now you need books and you need systematic structures such as religions to kind of kickstart the engine. You see what I'm saying? But it does show the condition of society that we are in that we need to read on how to treat each other. Now, yes, as the person so eloquently put, E is is, is for enlightenment, right? Think about, let's take two people out of the Bible. Let's take Abraham and let's take Moses. The Bible says that Abraham was the father of faith, right? But Abraham didn't have a Bible. (laughs) The Bible said Moses was face to face with God himself. God came down, the father, God, the creator himself came down on the mountain to speak to Moses. And Moses did all that without having a book. Matter of fact, Moses wrote the book. You see, and if you read the Bible, the only person who had a greater relationship with Abraham and then Abraham and Moses with God, whose name is mentioned all throughout the Bible as people to look forward to, was Jesus. And you didn't see Jesus walking around with a Torah in his hand. These people, he, they had faith. They had that faith. So what what I see is that I especially see it in religion. Abraham didn't have a book, so Abraham had to live it. When the voice in Abraham's head said, go, he had to get up and he had to take action. Moses didn't have a book. So when, when, when God told Moses, go, he had to get up and he had to go. But what I see now is that now that we do have the word, why are we doing considerably less than the people who didn't have the word? The ancient Egyptians didn't have any books at all, but they educated the whole entire world. But now blacks have all the books in the world and we can't even feed ourselves. We can't even clothe ourselves. We can't even maintain the conditions of our own communities. So what the book has done is the book has now replaced action. The book has now replaced real world experience. And now you can go to school or study a book and now emerge as a scholar on the subject. 
but you never lived it. You never walked it. You never been through it. You don't have any kind of experience in it whatsoever. You just read the book and emerge as a leader in the subject. So that is what I meant when I when I say not that we don't need to read, but that whatever we're reading, we need to apply it so that we know whether it's trash or not. Because oh, the Bible is trash and this book is trash. I like what Jesus said in that Bible. He said, "Listen, if you do what I say, then you will know whether or not I am from God." He said, "Wisdom is proven by its actions." So yeah, we have black people out here championing a lot of books, but I can tell they're not living it because if you was living it, you would see how impractical what that book is proposing. But the book sounds good, so now you're championing it as a solution to black problems. The reason why I can champion the Bible is because I live it, I walk it, I do what it says do, and I have seen the fruits of it. So you're telling me that cave dwellers. People who came out of cannibalism and pedophilia, people who was frozen up in the Caucasus Mountains, who came down as Vikings and cavemen. You're trying to tell me that these people wrote a book like the Bible? You're trying to tell me that out of Egyptian scholars and Caucasus Mountain cavemen, the Caucasus Mountain cavemen are the one who wrote the Bible? Or was it Egyptian scholars that wrote the Bible, but it was appropriated by our oppressors? You see, so no, I'm not saying that we don't need to read. I'm saying that reading should by no means take the place of action, because we read. Okay, now that we have read, and now that we have identified the problem, we've been identifying the problems for decades now. Now, what are we gonna do? Exactly. We know what the problem is. We know what the problem is. We need to do something about it. What are we going to do about it? So that was what I was saying. No, read, enlighten your mind, spark your mind. Use those books to to, to give new input into your mind, to put new gas into the car. But now once the car is gassed up, we got to go somewhere. See? So, sister, let's take um, let's take like maybe two more questions and then we'll do it there. So, right. well, well, give me, give me, give me Ooh, two I more think questions. This, this question, I like this question. Mm-hmm. Why do you feel like black men find the need to degrade the black women and put us down like mm-hmm. they do? Is this related to why they go to white men or white women or Kodak mm-hmm. Black's comments about why he doesn't like black girls mm-hmm. or the now popular video, The Good Guy and the Thought? My thing, coming from a black woman, mm-hmm. If a man comes to say and tells me, oh, you're pretty for a black girl, or you'd be prettier if you had straight hair, Ugh. a black man, by the way, not just a white man, a black man, Ugh. it's just like, what, like, what's your problem? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, is that like an insecurity? Because mm-hmm. to me, when a man says that, a black man says that about a black woman, I immediately think, what does your mother look like? Mm, right. Or what does your grandmother look like? Or your sister? Or what do you think your daughter is going to look like? You know mm. what I'm saying? Right. To me, so that I think that's like an insecurity or self-hate. Right. Or to me, it's just honestly, you're just so much into the system or so much into pop culture mm. with Lil Wayne saying, oh, he likes red bones, blase, blase. Right. Start thinking for yourself. Like, what do you actually like? You know what I'm mm. saying? That's what I want to tell them. But I just... I just go away. You know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> right, right. It's not worth the time. Like, right. It's really not worth the time to me. Right. But it's just like, think for yourself. Like, mm. do you think black women are pretty? Yes or no? Right. Don't let Lil Wayne and these rappers and books and like all these systems mm. tell you how to think. You know what right, I'm saying? Right, right. I mean, this is definitely a question that can be, that can be answered, you know, strongly by a black woman. Um, if I could... I would say you have to look at the condition of the black family. Yeah, that's busy. Yeah, most of black, as as my sister said, how does your mother look? I, I say that's a good point. And most of our black men, black men who are very degrading towards black women, they didn't have strong mother figures. Mm-hmm. Because if you had a strong, heroic a strong uh, uh, role model as a mother, 
then in every black woman you saw, you would see that strong black mother. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a father growing up, but I had a strong black mother in a family of strong black women. So now, even when I see a woman that's out there, you know, the new term is thought. I don't, I don't condone the degrading of my black sisters at all. Exactly, and it's not like not to cut you off again, but this no, is yeah. like a topic. This is a black woman's question. <laughs> it's like when you, oh, what was I gonna say? It's like when you have a black man, right, mm-hmm. and he's degrading a black woman. I don't care if you like white women. I don't care if you like Spanish. This is me mm-hmm. talking from my heart. You know what I'm saying? Right. I don't care who you find attractive. Just don't put me down. Right, right, Because, right. not to be cocky or anything, but a lot of the features that men go for in white women now, in Spanish women now, mm-hmm. was found in black women. You know <laughs> right, right, Now right. they want to say how, oh, white girls winning because they got a booty. Or <laughs> oh, Kylie Jenner looks so bad because she has lips. We've been had lips and booty. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. So right. it's like, why are you trying to strip us of our identity to give it to another culture. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. That's just, I don't right. care who you love. Love white people, love Spanish people, love Muslim, blue, green, blah, blah, blah. Just don't put your own people down. Right. That's right. that's my, that's my thing. And I, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll definitely agree with that. It's, it is the condition of blacks right now are in a state of confusion. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's crazy. Like I said, it's a black woman's question because I'm learning from, from these answers. <laughs> What I love about the what I love about the other cultures is the big butt, the big lips. It's like, but that was present in your own culture. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's just a sign of self hate. Exactly. It really, really, it really is really a sign is. of self hate in that blacks have been so disenfranchised with the black experience in America that we just want to get away from anything that reminds us exactly. of that experience. And that is really as a as a black male, that is really what. I believe is the problem with the black man degrading the black woman. Anytime you see black inflicting any kind of harm or negativity upon another black person, it is a sign of self-hate. So as we restore the, the black mother, the image of the black mother in the black community, we will see less black men that are so, they call it misogynistic, but we will see less black men who are so degraded their soul degrading towards black women as we destroy the strong male role model in a black home we will see uh, less black women as black men call them thoughts or whatever if you see a black woman that is promiscuous more times nine and a half times out of ten she did not have a strong father figure because a woman that has a strong father figure, she will look for a mate in those who have the same characteristics as that father. But a woman who does not have a strong father figure will now become the promiscuous woman exactly. on the streets. Because she's looking. She's right. looking for that peace to, you know what I'm saying, to fill her. Right, right. So the the whole, uh, as the question, the whole black women, black men going to white women... Um, call that blacks comments on not liking black women uh, the whole thought and all this it all comes from the broken black family mm-hmm. and we have to remember this if we don't know it we need to learn it as long as the family unit of a nation is broken the nation can never be restored yeah. I repeat as long as the family unit of the nation is broken, that nation cannot be restored. Black people cannot be restored as long as the black home is broken. What's the, what's the, you say black, um, the black family, what mm-hmm. is the unit? What's the family unit? The black, the black unit, the mother, the father, the child, the way it was in Africa. Now, we have people who come out now with studies that there was homosexuality in Africa and all of this stuff in Africa. If it was, it wasn't the culture. If you want to know the culture of lesbianism and homosexuality in Europe, in Athens, in Greece, in Rome, it was a culture. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an incidence or an occurrence. It was a culture. Practice they practiced it. But the culture of Africans was the king, 
the queen and the heir to the throne. The In the scripture in the Bible, it says the way that Moses got to Pharaoh was by killing his firstborn. The reason why that scripture was so significant is because African culture is the firstborn is the jewel of the family. The jewel of the African king is his firstborn son because his firstborn son is him that is going to carry on the legacy of that kingdom. So we are coming from a culture where the jewel of the black king is the firstborn. And now we are bringing people into a culture where the black home with the male, the woman, and the child has been destroyed. So now in this destruction, once again, you have black people in a state of confusion. You see what I'm saying? Lack of identity. Lack of identity. Once we get back to who we are, the king, the queen, the child, is one saying, and you can see this in the movie Boys in the Hood, it said one way you destroy a race is take away their ability to reproduce. The greatest way to destroy your race is take away their ability to reproduce. And one of the ways you take away their ability to reproduce is make the black man fight the black woman. See what I'm saying? So listen, we love y'all. We bless y'all. We honor y'all. We thank y'all for tuning in to this podcast. It's been real. Episode two of Glue the Movement Radio. And we got a lot more coming at you. Oh, I'm excited. We love it. We love it. We love it. So fun.